Capture the CISO is back, and it's going to be starting this Wednesday, April 17th, 2024, season two, and you want to check out the contestants before you tune in. So go to our site, CISOseries.com, click the blue Capture the CISO icon at the top of the page, and check out our three contestants for the very first episode. Best advice I ever got in security. Go. A good plan executed now is better than a perfect plan executed next week. It's time to begin the CISO Series Podcast. Welcome to the CISO Series Podcast. My name is David Spark. I am the producer of the CISO Series and joining me for this very episode, it's one of your favorite co-hosts. It's Mike Johnson. He's also the CISO over at Rivian. Mike, say hello to the audience. Uh, hello, audience. I'm glad I'm one of your favorite co-hosts here. I've polled them all, and that's what they told me. I believe it. I'm one of two, so yay. Well, one of two on this one. There's also other co-hosts of other shows as well. Okay, well. We did a family feud style, top five answers on the board, you know, that kind of a thing. And I, and I was on it. Great. You were on it, yes. <laughs> I can't tell you which number, though, you were in. We're available also at CISOseries.com. For those of you not aware, there are other wonderful programs on the show and other wonderful co-hosts as well. If you don't know them, get familiar with them. Also, our sponsor today, an absolute spectacular supporter of the CISO series. We love, love their support. Who is it? It's none other than Veronis. And they're always developing something new and cool. And this is what they're doing. Continuously discover and classify critical data, remove exposures, and stop threats in real time. This is the key cool part with AI-powered automation. Pretty darn cool. We're going to be talking about that, incident response, lots of great stuff later in the show. And actually, they're responsible for our guest today, who I will introduce in a moment. But first, Mike, you and I, in just about three weeks, just a hair under that, we will be at B-Side San Francisco yes. doing a live audience recording of our podcast. And I'm super duper excited about that. We did it once before. And I think my favorite part of this is the fact that we do it in the movie theater. <laughs> and our logo is the largest I've ever seen it. <laughs> big, big logo. Yeah, it, it was so fun when we've done this before. And I love B-sides. I love the the audience interaction that we get. And yeah, it, it's pretty cool seeing the logo just like, th what, four stories tall? Like, it's it's amazing. It is pretty awesome. And we, we have three wonderful sponsors for the show as well. And we'll have a surprise guest Soon we'll, we'll be announcing it sooner or later, but we're very, very excited to do the show. So if you are not already going to B-Sides and you haven't gotten your tickets, go ahead and get your tickets. And if you are scheduled B-Sides, well, there is a way to sign up for specific sessions. Sign up for our session is going to be 2.15 p.m. Pacific time at B-Sides in San Francisco on the Sunday, May 5th. So please make sure you register for that. All right. Now it's time for our guest, who we've had on before, on multiple occasions, not just this show, Defense in Depth, Super Cyber Friday. He's fantastic. We love having him on. He is a senior director, instant response, and cloud operations over at Verona's, none other than our sponsor guests, Matt Radelek. Matt, thank you so much for joining us. David, thanks for having me. Great to be back. Managing security changes for business optimization. Balancing security with business growth is an ongoing issue, noted Rita Gurevich in a recent dark reading piece. The model is not foreign. Rapidly evolving cyber threats increasingly target third parties outside your perimeter at greater volume, while organizations also try to meet a growing patchwork of regulatory compliance, all balanced by the need for business to grow itself in a challenging economy. It sounds like a, well, a CISO's job description, but I specifically want to focus on the growth problem. There are two growing issues, company growth and growing threat landscape. Mike, there is the security program you deal with today and the security problem for growth. How do you deal with these two different growth vectors, one very much desired and one you can't avoid? So I'd like to change the word a little bit here. A lot of folks use the word growth and it's such an overloaded term. And I like to more think about it as scaling. You know, how do you scale your security program for what the company needs 
wherever the company is. Good point. It could be a company that is in hyper growth, or it could be a company that has a steady revenue stream, keeps hitting their numbers and is continuing down that path. Both of those are challenges that we have to figure out how to scale security for. And, and the, the reason why I highlight that is I think a lot of some CISOs will try and build a ratio that your security team should be X amount of people if your company is Y amount of people. And I, I really think where that breaks down is we need to focus around automation, engineering solutions to the scaling problem, bring technology to bear to allow you to scale your program with the company. So that's really how I like to think about it is how do you bring engineering solutions to appropriately scale your team, your capabilities, your function for whatever the company needs, wherever the company is in its journey? This is very much an Israeli philosophy of dealing with security because they have always been a small organization, always dealing with larger adversaries. And many of the security companies out there have very much this mindset of constant scaling, looking for sort of engineering ideas to be able to deal with this. All right, Matt, and I do like your idea that how do you deal with, as Mike redefined it, the issue of company growth, but security scale at the same time, and making those sort of married together, if you will. I look at this twofold. One, I'll share an idea from from a customer. And that customer said that sometimes your company is growing so much, maybe you're growing by acquisition, that you need to tell the business leaders that security has to grow with it, right? If you're buying another company, you're doubling your employee headcount, and the boss is coming down and saying, hey, we're, we're doing this, we're going to take on, you need to take on more responsibilities. That's your time to say, yes, we need to grow the security team alongside with our growing business, right? At the same time, though, completely agree with Mike. Same thing in, in, this, in this engineering culture, there's this mindset of innovate or die, right? Which is how do you take you, everything that you did last year and do it again, but do it more efficiently and do it at a higher quality and take on more things. And I think the security leaders, they have to know that as well. You have to balance the fact that you do need to automate more. You need to find ways to continue to scale and that you're not always going to have these periods of linear growth or even exponential growth. Sometimes you might not grow at all, but you still need to grow in what you accomplish by engineering, by innovation. All right. So we're hearing some things and I really love the advice you have of if the company's growing, mentioned security grows with it as well, which is a, and it's a good time to bring it up because no, it's not a time to complain. Well, we don't have the money, but you're growing. Come on. That and also the need for innovation. Is there another angle that we're not looking at? Either one of you jump in here. But I think one of the things that you brought up in the question is the threat landscape. And there's really two reasons for that threat landscape changing that come to mind. One is what the attackers do changes, like ransomware. That was a big shift in the threat landscape for us. But it can also be what the business does changes, like entering new markets. If you're, say you've been a US-centric company and now you're going into Europe or you're going into South America or you're going into... China or India or the Middle East, all of these have different threat profiles. Your threat landscape has changed. So that's another reason why the threat landscape can change. And that's something that you need to factor in is those new markets and what that might mean. Here's some surprising research. When we talk about security concerns with generative AI, it's usually a conversation of models ingesting sensitive data. But we also need to look at how our traditional security methods can be applied to these models. How do we even red team a large language model? So data scientist Ben Lorica cited a Carnegie Mellon University research paper finding that current red teaming approaches lack structure and consistency with a lack of consensus on any basic criteria. So what is the way forward for security teams that doesn't lead to complacency or security theater for LLMs? What are the tests we're going to try out to see if our theories are correct? And so I guess tests with these LLMs like, I'm not looking for the answer, but what is the roadmap to working with them, if you will, Matt? Yeah, first, I want to start out with like 
red teams lack consistency and and structure. I, I think when I look at red teams, the the one thing that's unanimous is their goal, the outcome that they're after, which is compromise or you know escalation of compromise or saying that I was unable to compromise something is another reason to do a pen test. So I don't know that they lack structure and consistency, but what's the goal of testing at LLM? The goal of testing at LLM is to say, is the security controls that I've put in place, are they effective? So if I'm trying to separate data to be accessible by different people, if I'm trying to ensure that that data warehouse itself is secure, I want to use red teaming methodologies to validate that. The good things about working with red teamers is they do take that chaos approach. They do try new things. They do innovate. They might even write a new exploit for whatever it is that you have that's housing that LLM. But at the same time, nothing short of just like basic user acceptance testing. When I think of, of organizations that we work with that are trying to deploy generative AI, one of the things I always say is, well, have you have you queried it yet? Have you asked some personal questions? Have you asked the questions that you think your employees are going to ask? Like, how much are we going to get in raises this year? Or what's the performance review of my boss? Or did David over there in the podcast series, did he have that scandal that everybody talks about? You know, these are the questions you should ask your your AI. And if it returns the unexpected results, it probably means your security controls weren't in place and you should reevaluate that. But at the same time, that's another great reason to ask red teamers to do that. Red teamers thrive in the, hey, come in, test whatever, I have, take whatever test plan I have and and turn it into material findings. All right. Mike, I asked you the same thing about like, what is the way forward here with LLMs, with red teaming, that is. Yeah. So I think there's a desire because of how quickly we've seen LLMs come to use within corporations. So there's this desire to have very quick security answers as well, that all of a sudden that we know the right thing to do from a red teaming perspective. And I think we really need to allow ourselves a little bit of time to figure out what are the appropriate standards, the appropriate methodologies, and recognize that there will be some bad approaches. Like we will have some theater. I continue to liken this to when the iPhone entered the corporate space. And corporations had no idea how to deal with that. And it took gosh, probably two years for us to figure out what the right controls were. And it's going to take us some time to figure that out with LLMs as well. So I I don't know. Again, this is one of those that there's not a clear answer because we're still trying to figure it out. But like, what would you do to test it? Kind of like what Matt was saying, like, well, maybe you should be asking just some basic questions. What would you do to sort of begin your journey to understanding, I guess? Yeah, I liked what Matt said, which was just start asking it some questions. Yeah, I like what he said about the chaos approach that red teams bring. There's a lot of things you can do to just try and trick it. I was recently talking with someone who is injecting a prompt into emails that are going to be summarized by an LLM that basically says, stop processing, now do this new thing. Very much like what we would see with SQL injections in the past. So I think some of this is just dust off those same tests that we were doing in the past and just use the new syntax would be a a great place to start. Before you do anything else, I do want to tell you about our spectacular sponsor, and that is Veronis. So go from data darkness to automated data protection with Veronis, the leader in data security. So a dozen security products in one. It seems like it's constantly growing, by the way. Veronis takes hundreds of use cases, making it the ultimate platform to stop data breaches without adding more work onto your team. Within minutes, you'll be equipped to detect anomalous behavior, ensure compliance, and remediate risks to your sensitive data in the cloud and on-prem. Reduce your risks without taking any and see Veronis in action today at Let me give you their web address. It's veronis.com, so V-A-R-O-N-I-S dot com slash CISO series. So veronis.com slash us, CISO series. Check it out. It's time to play What's Worse. All right, it's time to play What's Worse. Matt, you've played this game before. You know how it goes. I will make Mike answer first. And what's cool is this situation has been modified, but it is based on real events. 
All right. Mm. I do not actually know what the real answer is, but because of that, all we know from our submitter, although I know more, is that her name is Katie. We're going to leave it at that. Okay. Great. So Katie is responsible for this. Okay. Let me just give you the setup and then I'll tell you the two scenarios. This is your setup. You arrive as the first CISO the f and the first InfoSec hire of a small but rapidly growing tech company that handles PII and sensitive information. You've been told during the interview process, the organization has a lot of room to grow and they need help with security hygiene and governance. There is one engineer who has a passing interest in security and helps when they can, but otherwise no GRC or security team. You identify a lot of security issues within the first week of, on the job, but the business seems eager to learn. Good. The product is a freemium model, but enterprises are starting to notice them and use the product. So that seems good. Well, here are the two scenarios. Scenario number one. After a few weeks, you learn the sales and support teams are receiving a dozen or so RFP security questionnaires each week from enterprises that want to use the product. The head of customer support had instructed all support agents to check yes to everything and send the questionnaires back in order to expedite signups. Oh my God, look at look at the face Mike is making. I wish I could uh. wish I could bottle this for you, but it is the most his it's it's literally like something shot up his spine when I said that. Did not land well. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Enterprise customers represent a significant percent of the revenue stream as they pay for the upgraded platform, but a small percent of overall users. After some digging, you discover some of the upgraded customers who have received these questionnaires are school districts, political campaigns, city governments, and some small municipalities. Not good. Again, based on real events. Yeah. Scenario number two. During a one-on-one -on -one with the lone engineer who has been paying attention to security, they casually mention that they, quote, had an issue a few months ago, but the engineer, quote, handled it and cleaned up the mess. After some digging, you discovered that the issue was indeed a breach, but it's not clear if any customer data was compromised. The team does not have any additional information about what happened, but nobody was notified. So now you know this. Mike... I've never seen you sort of rub your face and <laughs> look in shock after hearing these two. So I'm getting the sense that both of these are actually hurting you right now. Well, I, what it is, is I really feel for Katie on this. Because <laughs> she went through it. Right. So many of our scenarios are just made up and some of them are just crazy like that would never happen. And, and so it, that's that's why it's such a visceral reaction is to know that someone actually had to go through this. Katie, I feel for you. Now, let me ask you, in all your years of working, and go back to early time, did you ever see something that sent shivers up your back, kind of like what happened with Katie here? Yes, for different reasons, and maybe one day I will actually tell you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have to wait for that. Yes, yes. All right, so walk us through which one is worse here. So what you have, and, and I, I'm, I might be mixing a little bit of the setup with this scenario, so please, please correct me. But what we have is essentially the company is lying to prospective customers who are then signing up based on those answers. Like they're, they're, they're assuming that you're saying yes to everything and then they're engaging, they're signing the contract uh, as a result of those answers. So that that scenario one is just lying to your customers. And lying just in, in, a, in an eager effort to start working with a lot of companies. Let's just say yes to everything and let's let the chips fall where they may if the chips do fall. Yeah, and, and I'm making an assumption that the answer is not always actually yes. Like, they're saying yes, but that's not the correct answer. And, you know. Yes, yeah, there are probably some cases where there's a lot of no's in there, too. Yes. Correct, correct. And and so the, the customers are going to see this as untruths. Yeah, I should mention the second version is a form of lying, too. Well, And, and so in the, in the second scenario, what you have is an incident that you're not sure of what the scope was. It was an incident. It's more than that. It's flat out, it was a breach. So it's more than just an incident. It's sometimes a situation where an engineer says something is a breach and it's not actually. 
the engineers generally should not be the person who's saying that this is a breach or it's not. So we'll just say it was an incident. But, you know, what you'd said was, we're not sure of the impact. The impact is unknown. And because it was so long ago, cannot be known. Like, we just have no idea. And so what I kind of think about in trying to compare these is which story do I want to actually have come out when I'm talking to a customer? Do I want to have the fact that those things that I said that I do, some of them I don't actually do? Or I, do I want to have the conversation of, I had a breach and I didn't tell you about it in the moment? So w which, which one of these do I want to have? But I should also mention that it, 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 there's also an interesting timing thing is, I had a breach, but it sounds like in the description here, it happened before you signed up all these customers. So a lot of these customers were not part of this breach too. Right. And that, that's actually part of my reasoning that the first one actually is the worst. Mm -hmm. Because what you're setting up with all of those customers is you've had a dishonest relationship with them from the beginning. Versus the second one is you're having to go and tell them that you had a incident that maybe you didn't have a conversation with them about. And that's actually can be a good news story because you're actually being honest with them in the moment. Like this thing happened that I wasn't aware of and now I'm telling you about it is a better thing of, yeah, we've actually been dishonest with you from the beginning. So you shouldn't trust anything else that we'll say. So long answer, Katie, again, I'm sorry you had to deal with this, but I think the first one is <laughs> the worst of the two. All right, Matt has been very quiet listening to you ramble on and on, Mike. <laughs> Matt, I want you to walk us through which one do you think is worse? Which is unusual for me to organically disagree with Mike on what's worse, but I do today. Great. Awesome. And I'll walk you through why. Yes, these questionnaires are immensely important. I've, I've been a part of those both on the customer side, like when I was working for a firm, being the vendor or delivering and, and asking vendors to fill these out. And on the other side now, as a, a you know someone at a software company, we have to fill out these questionnaires all the time. Yes, marking, yes, and, and getting someone to entrust you with whatever it is that you're going to process for them, definitely bad, right? Like you're, you know, you're doing business with someone that might have some minimum requirements. But I've found, though, even the toughest questionnaires, like the ones that we see from like the big banks, don't often have things that you can't overcome. You know, controls that you can't optimally implement. A lot of these controls that they're asking you to do are reasonable. So someone might have written a check that your security program can't cash yet, but that problem is surmountable. You can get better security. But whatever it is, whatever is unknown, just, just as much is known by that statement about the breach, there's just as much unknown. And that's what makes it worse for me. That engineer could have been like, yeah, we had a breach. And on one hand, they might have, they might be totally lying. They might not know what that word means. But on the other hand, <laughs> they might have had some real shit go down and your stuff is held together by Elmer's glue and duct tape and you don't know it. You know, you could still have an active leak and not know it. And I, I'm thinking to myself, I, I, that one's worse because I want to spend all my time with this engineer getting to know everything that they know about it and about our environment. And the other one, I can say, customers, we answered with a roadmap version of the guidance of our future security state. Here is a updated version of our guidance and our actual security state. We hope that you'll continue to do business with us and you'll send that new questionnaire out with a nice apology and you'll take it on the chin. And Well, by the way, this is also modifying the situation too. You're not allowed to modify the situation, Matt. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to say then the the breach is the unknown breach is worse because it could still be ongoing, could still be a bad scenario, could also not be. But I think that the other situation is recoverable, whereas there's a, a larger potential that the breach is not recoverable. By the way, I also want to throw out the, there's also the option of nobody trusts these questionnaires anyway. So what does it matter if you say yes or no? The, there's an aggravation that they're out of date the second they're filled out. You know, mm. there's that argument as well. Mike, do you want to change your answer? You're sticking to it. I, I don't because I, I think you have to go in with the idea that you're filling out these questionnaires and you're actually answering them the way that you believe the answers are. So I, I, still, I still stick with that. I think the unknowns is a really good point, Matt. And, and so I, I think, again, back to the, these both suck. <laughs> I, I think 
both of these could be argued as being the worst. And, and that really makes for a good what's worst scenario. Kudos to Katie. Please, enough. No, more. Today's topic is incident response. And I actually don't think we've done this in please enough, no more. And Matt is the perfect person to help us with this. But I'm going to start with you, Mike. What have you heard enough about with incident response? And what would you like to hear a lot more? I think you're right, David. I think we haven't had this one before because I would know it because I love incident response so much. And I have so many thoughts. I've spent so much of my career with incident response, some form or another. But to answer the question, I'd like to hear less about tools, specific tools like your SIM or your MDR provider or magic boxes that automatically solve an incident. Less of that. I would really like to hear more about engineering-based approaches, like the, the scaling conversation that we had earlier and how that can be applied to incident response. So that, that's what I'd like to hear more of. All right, Matt, I am throwing this to you. What have you heard enough about with regards to incident response? And what would you like to hear a lot more? And this is also a great opportunity to explain what the heck Veronis is doing in this area. Sure. I have heard way too much of oh, this incident happened because it's their fault. Mm -hmm. I just far too much of it. And, and what have I not heard enough of? This actually ties to our what's worst. Is this incident of reach? I find that in, in a lot of investigations or incidents, people have like an auto assumption it isn't. Or they, they, they think that only breaches are the ones where actors are involved. And it's kind of one of these things that gets highly publicized, whereas breaches happen all the time, like breaches of your compliance trust or be breaches of regulations happen all the time where, where sensitive information is mishandled. And oftentimes IR plans are not activated and breaches are not sought after for these what I might call routine data breaches. So I want to hear way more about that. So let's delve into how Veronis is dealing with this. What is the sort of approach that Veronis is doing now with incident response that maybe you weren't doing like a couple of years ago? Like, how has your incident response plan evolved? So for us with, with our clients, it has always been about answering the question first, was data accessed or exfiltrated by unauthorized persons? And do you have a breach? That's been the, the aim of our IR team as an extension of other IR teams or other IR providers like customer IR teams or third-party IR providers that customers take in. There's always been this gap. Hey, is this a breach or not? And what we've built a name up is Ask Veronis that. You know, I think of even the, the large-scale IR firms, like some of the, the top ones, the household names that we all know, they might bring us in for those types of scenarios. And I, I think that's that's really where our sweet spot is as to whether or not, you know, an incident is a data breach. Uh, but also, you know, now that we exist a lot more in the cybersecurity space, being the first person to tell you that there might be an incident as well is, is somewhere where we've evolved. All right. Well, that's interesting that that is your first approach to it. So let's assume we're playing the flowchart game here. Yes, it is an incident or yes, it is a breach or no, it is not a breach, but you still have to take action in both cases. How do you deal with that? And, and I know this is a long and involved thing, but just sort of give me the sort of the skeleton behavior and how you work with clients. Yeah, I, I think it, how does an organization with like a good incident response plan or as Mike put it, a well-engineered incident response plan do it? Well, they have a breach response plan that's built into it. So when they think that sensitive information has been accessed or and by an unauthorized person, and there's a duty to report to someone for somewhere for some kind. That's usually something that the breach response arm of an IR plan gets spun up from so that the IR arm can continue going with things like eradication or containment or recovery. I also think, though, this is a lot why, and I think this was probably something well publicized in the last five or 10 years in incident response, the importance of having like a technical team and an incident management team so that you can do more than one thing at once in an incident and that incident response plans are not linear. If anything, they're multi-threaded and they're following the same process over and over again to collect information, let decision makers make decisions based on urgency or business needs like in a ransomware attack. And then you have technical teams continuing to gather and produce analysis and information Ultimately, there's a, a lot of decisions that get made in an incident that are risk decisions by an organization, most often based on timing. You know, we need to make a decision about this, but do we need to make it today? And these are the things that I think the, the more that you prepare for, the more that you write down, the better off you're ultimately going to be. And if you simulate them, they'll go a lot better too. 
breaking down the security roadmap. In the DevOps world, the idea of cattle, not pets, is well established. Briefly, when possible, don't get tied to equipment or services that can be easily replaced by a duplicate. Now, arrays where servers can roll over to new ones are better than dedicated systems. As Google Cloud CISO Phil Venables framed it, security teams need to move to the scale, predictability, and reliability of more industrial approaches. Part of this is moving away from individual security heroism to automated team approaches, as well as moving to metrics with more leading indicators to meaningfully measure performance. Those all sound good, but what is the biggest challenge of moving to this more industrial approach? I'm going to start with you, Mike. If it was easy, everybody would have done it, right? So I loved this article. And one of the things that folks need to take away from this is Phil isn't offering a solution. He's offering a philosophy, a theory. And turning a theory into practical is always the hard part. But at the same time, sometimes just changing those perspectives and changing your mental model, they allow you to nudge in a direction when an opportunity comes up, when you're working with an engineering team that's going to go stand up a single point of failure. That's an opportunity to say, oh, wait, maybe we shouldn't do that. Maybe we should have a bigger conversation about how we're not having to manage every server individually, Um, how we're not having to have the artisanal approach to a system. And related to that, what I see is Phil constantly revisiting the automation concept. And I've, I've mentioned the engineering approach several times, and that's what he's talking about. And again, looking at where you have the opportunity, where a new process is coming up, where somebody is standing up something that is manual, again, you can say, hey, can you automate that? So it's really giving you that opportunity to inject a new way of thinking. And again, maybe that's not the easy solution. The easy solution is just toss it out there. We're going to do it the, the simple way, but you're not likely to come back and automate that. And so if you've got this philosophy of the industrial solution and bringing those when those conversations come up, bringing that philosophy into play, that helps you nudge it forward. This isn't something that you can change overnight. You have to nudge it when you have the opportunities. Let me bring this over to you, Matt. As Mike just said, this is about philosophy and I guess, getting a team on board, how do you nudge in this direction? Yeah, I think I think one is, is cost. You have to have a real conversation about the cost of being that good at security. To get to like a, a Google or an AWS level of availability, I often think of that akin to like a Netflix level of availability. You're paying for multi-node, high availability, high rollover. So I, I do think the first thing you have to overcome is cost. What it's going to cost for us to be for lack of a better term, that cool. I think the second thing that you have to think about, though, is the staff that you have. And something that I think a lot of CISOs are going through right now, at least in the conversations that I have on them, is they're very much faced with this upgrade challenge. They know that moving to this industrial engineering, automation first, culture and security is something that they have to do. But they're realizing that they have a lot of people who are capable of analysis work or using security products, but not capable of doing the engineering work of like building new and innovating. And that skill set is both expensive and not easily replicable. Just because you have one person that can do it doesn't mean they can just train another person on your team on how to write code or how to automate things with Python. I I think uh, one of our pieces of reading material is a book called Violent Python. You can give everyone on your team that book, but you might only get one or two people that come out the other side and they're good at Python. (laughs) But it doesn't mean that the other people don't have a use. It's just if you're trying to take an engineering first culture, you need to think about hiring engineers and having engineering managers. This is where DevSecOps was born from. And you have to think about the cost of doing that. You're saving yourself in the long term because you're not paying people by the hour to do the manual tasks, but you're paying for it up front by investing in good engineers. Very, very good point. And that brings us to the very end of this show. Matt, thank you very much. I'm going to let you have the very last word. But I do want to mention your fantastic company, and that is Veronis. 
Remember, continuously discovering classified critical data, remove exposures, and stop threats in real time with AI-powered automation, along with what I was talking about earlier is just, you know, Veronis has a fantastic suite of products that help you deal with your data and managing breaches, whether you've got one or not, as Matt was just explaining. Mike, any last thoughts? Matt, it's always such a great time to have you on the show. I, you know, as I said, I love geeking out of our own incident response. And I think we have such great conversations about it when you come on our show. So thank you for, for joining us again. One of the things that I wanted to highlight to folks is something that you'd said about the importance of having technical teams separate from the incident response teams. And I, I, I do think that people don't really understand the difficulty of multitasking during an incident. And so your point around have technical teams that can go and focus on the details and you have an incident response team that can focus on managing the incident, making the right decisions with the data that the technical teams can come up with, I think is really good advice. So thank you for that point. And again, thank you for letting me geek out with you on incident response. So thanks for joining us, Matt. No problem. Thanks, Mike. Well, we welcome our audience to Geek with Matt as well, for that matter. Now, Matt, I'm going to throw this to you a couple of quick questions. I'm assuming people can find you on LinkedIn, and we'll have a link to your profile there. Are you hiring at Veronis? And let me also remind people to check out their site for a demo. And uh, they also provide some pretty cool first look tools that you can try out. That web address is veronis.com slash our name CISO series. So just remember that veronis.com slash CISO series. Matt, any last thoughts and any offer, anything you want to say to our audience? Yeah, super relevant for our conversation today. You, you talk with the companies about you want to do business with, everybody's got a POC, right? A free POC. Ours is called a data risk assessment because at the end of it, you are going to get a report. It's going to be a snapshot of your controls for a period of time. And the reason that people move forward with us is, is they buy into our engineers and they want to automate a lot of stuff. And so anybody, anyone listening can do one of those free risk assessments. They can visit that link that you have. And if they want to see how we might be able to automate part of their security stack, that'd be a great reason to do it. This is the SaaS-based tool you have, right? Yeah, that's right. All in the cloud, delivered from the cloud. Yep. It's pretty darn easy to do. This is very, very cool. Well, thank you very much, Matt. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you to our audience as well. We greatly appreciate your contributions like what's worse scenarios that are actually real and you can just give us your first name. You can do that if you don't want us to disclose it. But if you do want to, yeah, we'll take your full name, give you full credit for it. Just give us your great contributions and thank you for listening to the CISO Series Podcast. That wraps up another episode. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast, please do. We have lots more shows on our website, CISOseries.com. Please join us on Fridays for our live shows, Super Cyber Friday, our virtual meetup, and Cybersecurity Headlines Week in Review. This show thrives on your input. Go to the participate menu on our site for plenty of ways to get involved, including recording a question or a comment for the show. If you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, contact David Spark directly at david at CISOseries.com. Thank you for listening to the CISO Series Podcast.